Welcome to Coffee House. So the secret shift in Disney narratives, contemporary Disney and Pixar has been unfulfilling. There often seemed to be something missing, especially in the newest era. I wasn't sure what it was. It was something that I had thought about pretty consistently, but every time I watched one of the newer ones, it felt like there was something empty in there. Where the golden age of Disney was timeless and gorgeous and meaningful, with deep psychological value and insight, the new age Disney seemed pretty but vacuous. And what people don't realize, there has been a dramatic shift, not just in the surface presentation, you know, from 2D to 3D, or the surface values, you know, we have the introduction of woke characters, these woke character stereotypes that make it into all these now. You have, uh, more often than not, you have females who are inexplicably capable now, and males who are bumbling idiots, and much more often, male villains. And you have other things like, uh, you know, you have the, the remakes that will have a special emphasis, especially on female characters. They'll give them more more to do and more importance in the story. So like the female Lion and Lion King, which I haven't even watched the full remake of Lion King. It looks so bad. It looks so incredibly bad, even though it's trying to be just a shot for shot live action remake of Lion King, even though it's all computer generated. It looks real bad. But in that, they make sure to emphasize the role of one of the female lions. Jasmine has more significance in the Aladdin remake. That was terrible too. That, there's so many reasons that was terrible. There are a bunch of woke references specifically, like in movies like Zootopia. You have have uh, things like Frozen was kind of uh, a big turning point in this where they issued the idea of the savior prince, you know, Prince Charming in favor of the sisterly love. So they specifically had to deal with that and work off of that idea so that they could throw in the twist of it being about sisterly love instead of romantic love. Which is annoying in its own right, but um, there are a lot of annoying things about Frozen. You have no idea. And then you have these reforming of villain characters, but specifically, and I went and looked at this to try to see which villains are being rehabilitated in the Disney universe. And so far, as Maleficent has two movies of her re rehabilitation, and Cruella has one, but I didn't see any other ones. So it's specifically just the female villains that I've seen so far that have been rehabilitated. But anyway, so apart from all that stuff, there's a seismic shift under our feet that a lot of people don't realize when it comes to storytelling in Disney and Pixar. So historically, there was, and I'm going to put these in two general categories, although the labels might not be the most applicable, but you'll, you'll see why I use them. So conservative were the... Disney movies historically, and I know they have very specific eras in Disney that a lot of Disney fans put these demarcations of the golden age and like the new era and the re revitalization or whatever it is, whatever it's called. But I'm not doing it specifically that way. So anyway, so this is the conservative movies. So these are characterized by movies where the characters have to reconform to the old ways. So they don't have integration of separate worlds. There are separate worlds set up in the movie, but you don't have those integrating by the end. And usually the character is dealing with dual identities. So the flaw is within themselves that they're trying to figure out and work through and get to the end of. And their problem or their dueling identity issue, the issue is solved when they affiliate with some pre-existing group. So one of the groups that was already existing, they affiliate with that group and that's how they solve the problem and figure out what their identity is. So they're incorporated into the group. So the movies that are characterized in this conservative structure are Lion King, Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella, and Mulan. So specifically, Lion King, you have Simba who, you have the two groups, you have the, the ruled over, you know, all the other animals and the hyenas and the lion Lions. So you have those two groups. And so Simba is dealing with his identity of being king versus being a kid. And he has to learn to grow up and then reclaim his position as king. And then once he reclaims that, he remains king and the lions remain the royalty. And the the animals, the other animals remain, you know, the subjects in the kingdom. So Little Mermaid, you have these separate worlds of underwater and above water, the human world. And so Ariel's dealing with this issue of which is her identity, which does she want to be a part of. Of. And obviously he she uh, goes for Eric and there are a bunch of problems, <laughs> intervening problems based on Ursula and her dad being not so happy about it. But eventually she chooses one of the worlds, one of the groups, you know, the human group, and she decides to stay with them. You don't have an integration of the underworld.
underwater and the overwater. They still go about their business, uh, but she integrates into one of those. Uh, Beauty and the Beast is a, a similar thing. It's not as explicit, but it's you have the Beast and you know his cavalcade, his group in society. They're the royalty, and they're kind of the outsiders. You know, they're all made of furniture and and everything. And she's part of the other the townspeople who want to kill the Beast. And so eventually she moves from that group to the other group and realizes you know through her identity issues it's really I really need to watch that again it's a good one but through her identity issues she works that out by realizing she wants to be with the beast and you know obviously he turns into a prince and they all turn back to humans so there's an argument there to say it's it's some kind of reintegration but it's not like he gives up his princehood and he's no longer going to be royalty or she's not going to be royalty or anything so they maintain that those two separate groups and she just picks one Cinderella you have a similar thing where there's the underclass that's her there's the the ruling class that's her stepmother and the you know her two daughters and the prince and they try to say okay you're not part of our group but then she eventually becomes part of the group and then Mulan same thing is that she's okay she's the woman class who doesn't get to fight they have the military class who gets to fight with the men she becomes part of it and then eventually integrates into the military class so so that's the whole point is that you have these different groups and these hierarchies in society that are established this is history and but they maintain throughout and eventually the character resolves their own internal flaws and identity issues by aligning themselves with one of the groups. So, to see it, move on to the other side, you have the modern Disney Pixar movies, and this is kind of the liberal structure. The way this works is that you have to change the society to your own image. So, the way it starts out is that the world seems utopian. You know, think about the beginning of the Lego movie. Uh, what's that song? Like, everything is perfect or something like that. But, so, the way that these start out, and, and Zootopia, the way that these start out, is, it seems like the world is, is a utopia. It seems perfect on the outside, but really... The there's this underbelly that suggests that it's actually absolutely horrible and needs to be, uh, you know, overturned. There's this orderly hierarchy that's that's apparent in society, and that's first established. And then you have a person who's specific in their one job. They are they have one particular job, and they're happy in that one particular job. Uh, but the overall arc of the movie, the idea in the movie, it's about accepting the change. So you usually have kind of this idea of there's an outcast. The outcast becomes a rebel, and the rebel becomes a leader to you know it's like the Hegelian dialectic <laughs> where you have the outcast becomes a rebel, rebel becomes a leader, and the leader. Uh, conducts the overthrow of the system to institute a new system. The leader changes the world to their own image. So the flaw is not in the person, the flaw is in this in the world. The flaw is not in the character that has to be resolved. The flaw is in how the world is is functioning. It seemed good, but it actually wasn't and it's flawed and needs to be replaced. So the movies that typify this idea are like Zootopia, Lego Movie, Ratatouille to some degree, Inside Out, Toy Story, and The Incredibles. So in in these, what happens by the end is that you get the worlds integrated. Uh, They become part of each other. They get mixed all together. It gets overthrown. And the person gets to create society as a reflection of them instead of um, resolving their identity issues by moving into one vein of society or the other. So Zootopia, you have the separate worlds of the predators and the prey, and eventually the predators and prey work together because the one prey bunny figured everything out and just resolved everything by means of their own will. A Lego movie, you have a similar thing where they're the boring and the specials, but they get integrated by the end. Ratatouille, you got them integrated by the end. <laughs> you know, they're all working together by the end. The two separate worlds, instead of just resolving yourself to one of the other worlds. Inside Out, everybody has to be um, included. You know, you realize that sadness is an important part, so everybody's included and they all work together. So on and so forth. So you, the idea is just there are separate worlds, but the through the actions, the, the protagonist has an interest in changing the entirety of the structure rather than maintaining any of the structure and integrating all the different worlds into one thing instead of allowing there to be distinctions between them. So the moral upshot is this, that so for the classic ones, they encourage self-reflection and respect for what has worked before. So you think about internally, okay, what is my flaw and how does, how does the way the world is structured, how does that reflect on me and how do I integrate myself into the way the world is structured? For the modern, it encourages self-deification and imposing your values on everybody else. So it's specifically structured around the idea that you have this adolescent certainty about the way the world should be and that you are correct and really the center of the turning world 
and you need to combine all of the the structures that are out there into one thing under which you could have it to reflect yourself. So, of course, the danger of this is that every fascistic society believed itself to be absolutely morally right and regarded people, especially opponents, as a means to a greater end of accomplishing the utopia that they were seeking. One of the quotes, you know, probably the most important quote for our <laughs> our times now is, uh, quote, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times, end quote. So what's important here is to see how did we get to a point of having stories in this vein instead of the other. So as a child, you enter the world and things are orderly and safe. That's what you know about them. You had no hand in creating these circumstances. It looks easy. You know, as a child, especially as you're getting into puberty and then becoming a teen and going to school and all those things, the way that you see it is that it was so simple. You always had food. You know, you always had shelter, depending on your childhood, obviously. It certainly wasn't the same for all of us. <laughs> but uh, for most people in in a well-developed country like the United States, that's what it's like. It's like you're born, you always have shelter, you always have food. That's you never want for that kind of a thing. So it looks easy to establish the society that you have. So the only reason that writers at Pixar and Disney are capable or inclined to tell stories like the ones, the modern ones that we talked about, is because of the comfortable and orderly context. That's what they're, they have to work with, and that's likely the fertile ground from which these, these ideas have sprung. So culturally, we've become so comfortable that we have to pretend that imperfection, by whatever childish standard one wants to apply, is disorderly and evil and there's a desperate need to rectify it. This is reflected in our fiction, which reinforces the same idea. So the idea, especially the dangerous idea of the modern ones, is that even though it looks nice on the surface, you know, really, it's it's super terrible. And it's not that there's some kind of a, an objective measure or obvious measure for it being so terrible. It's saying that the subterranean aspect of it is actually, you don't realize there's all this violence being done, but in reality, there's all this violence being done. It's just like this weird conflation of speech and violence that we have today. When you don't have enough violence to be able to use, then uh, you can use something like speech to say that it's violence because there's tons and tons of speech. So suddenly it's an epidemic where it was something that was on a steep decline. You know, Stephen Pinker's book talks about that, how criminality has actually been on a very steep decline for a long time. Especially after the 90s, we had a very steep decline in criminality. And yet they need something as the foil, as the uh, the boogeyman to be able to use. But what this means when it comes to the stories is that the stories are less sincere, less personal, less meaningful, less psychologically complex, and more didactic. Because you have to think, okay, what... If you are starting out with a character, specifically the character is supposed to be the harbinger of change. They already know what needs to be done, so they're just going to do it. Then you can't have the same psychological complexity. And you have to have more didacticism that they're just going to be pontificating. They're going to be standing on a soapbox and just saying, this is the way that it needs to be. That's what you'd expect, and that's what you see more in movies nowadays, in Pixar and Disney ones. So again, you don't need the complex psychology if your character is only there to be right. And the viewers don't need to be psychologically complex either. It starts to drain the populace of inclinations toward nuance because they say that, well, you don't need the nuance. We just have decided that we figured out everything that's wrong with the world and we need to go out there and change the world. So I thought that this was just a really interesting distinction between the way storytelling was done throughout, you know, like the first half of the 20th century and into, I mean, it must have gone, it went through the 80s and 90s where you had Disney still telling stories like this. And and then you have the shift in the types of stories they want to tell with Pixar and Disney after 2000. You know, it's like the late 90s after 2000, you have this big shift in the way that they want to tell stories and what they are actually saying about their protagonist and therefore the viewer that they're trying to reach. So anyway. I hope that was uh, useful in some way. I hope that's really a springboard to try to understand the way that especially animated movies that are targeted toward children are trying to tell stories now because you can absolutely see the shift. And for me, it started out as just a, it didn't feel quite right anytime I watched one of these. It was like something was a little off that they didn't seem like they had the same meaning or gravitas that they used to have. And then you have to sit and think about it and try to determine what's actually different between these things beyond, you know, just the the style or whatever. So anyway, uh, that that was that one. That was about Disney and Pixar. I hope that was worth uh, listening to. I hope all is well, and I will see you on the next one. <laughs>